Hi, everyone. I'm Young Kim in geography, and thanks for coming to the Wells and Poverty Public Lecture. And before I introduce our speaker today, come on in, guys. Let me briefly talk about the wealth and poverty theme. And let's see, how many of you have heard about the themes? Themes? Great, great. Thanks a lot. So, for those who have not heard about the themes, here, you go to the College of Arts and Science homepage, and you will see the theme it in the upper left, upper right and you click on it and you will see what the themes are and how and why they would help you in choosing courses outside your major to meet college and university requirements. So please do check out that. And this fall, the College of Arts and Science is offering five themes, including the wealth and poverty theme. And here, the, this is just the Wealth and Poverty theme curriculum. The Wealth and Poverty theme is to address and combat issues of inequality and poverty in, within and between countries. So, so this is for undergraduate students, not for graduate students. And if you are interested in why there is inequality and poverty in, let's say, Appalachia, or urban poverty in American cities, or, or like many poor countries, poor peoples around the world, then this wealth and poverty is offering a great interdisciplinary program of study and a lot of activities, just like this public lecture for very student-oriented program. So, and we offer a certificate under the same name. So if you complete at least 18 credit hours, then you get a certificate. It will show up on your transcript. Then, then if you are interested in pursuing wealth and poverty, whether that's a curriculum certificate or theme, you may contact any of these professors uh, and check out the website and ask your advisor about the theme and certificate. So that's about the wealth and poverty then. Now. Our honorable speaker, Dr. Laxman Yapa. Dr. Yapa is a professor of geography at Pennsylvania State University. Indeed, we have a couple of people who took classes from him, and Dr. Lisa Witten in geography and Elliot Abrams in anthropology. And his teaching and research interests are in poverty and postmodern discourse theory. Dr. Yapa has published extensively on urban poverty in the US as well as poverty in developing countries. He's also served as a consultant to a number of development organizations, including the World Bank, USAID, and the UNDP, and some national governments like Sri Lanka. From 2000 to 2010, Dr. Yapa directed a community-based service learning course in West Philadelphia, and the course is titled Rethinking Urban Poverty, the Philadelphia Field Project. You're gonna talk more about that today's class, right? Yes, and for that effort, indeed, he received the prestigious C. Peter McGrath University Community Engagement Award in 2008. And without further ado, I will let you hear from Dr. Yoffe. Can you hear me right at the back? Yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> so Young, thank you for those kind words. And I want to thank Dean Frank for uh, getting these teams organized. And uh, Athens is a charming city, or at least the parts that I've seen so far. And uh, the people are also quite charming. And so I'm very happy to be here. And now we'll talk about something 
a little bit more depressing poverty. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I've been thinking about poverty for some reason. Uh, since I was about yay high, I've been yay high ever since. But uh, the, uh, that story is not half as interesting as the one that I'm about to tell you. So uh, <clears throat> I also brought, you know, I feel like I'm uh, staring at this headlight of a car. So I, if I'm squinting, it's, it's because I can't, I'd like to see you and I can't. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> I brought far more slides than I need, but, um, and, I, and I'm going to gloss o pass over them so that I can use it to answer questions. I'm not going to use all of those slides. Uh, so here's the <clears throat> basic, uh, is there an echo there, or is this, is this about just about right? Yeah? Move it up. Huh? Move it up. Move it up. It's going to be a lot louder. Did you say move it up? More up? If I do that, it's going to come loud and you know what that, right? <laughs> okay, all right, yeah. The, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, if I move it f any further, it's going to slash my throat with the sound. <clears throat> The, uh, uh, so, the, uh, there are four, now it's not working. Is it working now? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There must be a secret. Oh, oh he can adjust the volume? Yeah. Oh, that's the one who's been finagling this, yeah. <laughs> It's my fault, yeah. So, the, uh, um, so what I'm going to do is in about three or four parts. So let me give you that overall narrative before I start getting into the detail. So we start with a fairly conventional definition of poverty, and uh, which I call the exchange value view, not having enough money. And then I'm going to uh, uh, propose what's wrong with that, explain what's wrong with that, and then talk about the need for a new theory of poverty. And in order to explain this new theory of poverty, we got to talk about how the economists talk about scarcity and also offer an alternative conceptualization of scarcity, which I call socially constructed scarcity. Uh, and then I'll give you, and that stuff is a little abstract, and, but I'll give you some very concrete examples of how this new theory of poverty can be practiced. And finally, I want to talk about the central role of the university in generating that new knowledge. Because it turns out that we're really not an ivory tower, that what we say does matter in how we imagine how the world functions. So that's about uh, the, uh, uh, the gist of it. So I'm going to uh, pass through various slides. Uh, this is about what Jesus Christ said about the poor. If I start this story, it's going to take about five minutes. And if you find this story interesting, we, we can come back to it. Yeah. Uh, so let me start with our friend Bill Gates. Yeah. So the exchange value view of poverty says that people are poor when they don't have money. People are poor when they don't have money. Everybody knows that. I should pitch that line to the Geico commercial. Everybody knows that. And uh, now, so if you look around, that's what the World Bank tells you when they measure poverty. You're poor if you have uh, less than $2 a day. You're extremely poor if you have less than $1 a day. And they have very elaborate, very sophisticated economists who calculate these things. The US Census gives you the poverty map, and that's how it measures uh, poverty counties. President Obama, if you listen to him, he talks about uh, poverty in this way. People are poor when they don't have money. Saul Alinsky, who's the other Chicago community organizer, uh, he, he, he talks, he said, you know, it's simple. Poverty is simple. People are poor when they don't have money. Uh, Al Sharpton, um, uh, Bill Gates, Bill Gates has a link. You should go check it out. He's saying that world poverty will be eradicated in 2035. Mark that, 2035. Oh, joy, I want to live to that time, you know? And, and, and so uh, the, uh, uh, 
But the whole point of this talk is that it is precisely this view of poverty that keeps poor people poor. Precisely this view. And so, so it's very hard to wrap your, and it took me a long time to understand that. And, uh, and it's taking even much longer to explain that. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, so start with this idea of what I call the use value and the exchange value view of poverty. Let's start with use value. Use value is simply the use of a good. So it could be uh, you know, food for my health, food for hunger, for nutrition. And, and, there, and then the basic use values are uh, food, living in a healthy body, uh, um, transport, housing, etc. Now, exchange value view is that uh, you, you produce things so that you can make money out of it. And there's nothing, in, 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 there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that, except that we subjugate the use value to, to exchange value. That's when we, we, we run into, into problems. So, <clears throat> the, uh, 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 in fact, if you read Karl Marx, many people think that use value and exchange value is a Marxian concept. Uh, it is not. The, if you, uh, the first chapter of Das Kapital uh, on commodities starts with use value and exchange value, and, and he has a very interesting discussion. But I don't know how many of you are Marxists, but he also drops that topic after the first chapter, which I thought was a fateful mistake. And uh, uh, so the, it, it's not necessarily a Marxian concept, because Adam Smith talks about this in The Wealth of Nations. And every great religion, uh, tra religious tradition, uh, Christianity, uh, Islam, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, talks about this distinction of producing things just for money as opposed to producing things for, 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 for use. The, uh, uh, the, uh, so use value, as I said, is the uh, utility that you get from consuming this good. And uh, a good can have many use values, uh, whereas exchange value is fairly unique. You know, it's the amount of, it's very precise. It's, it's the price of, the, of that good. It turns out that the man who's really written a lot on this is an a, a Austrian philosopher, uh, Ivan Illich. He was a Jesuit priest at one point, and uh, he died a few years ago. If you read some of his books, Towards the History of Need, uh, most of the ideas that are coming from were inspired by uh, what he said. So let me move on. So uh, uh, this is like a airplane cockpit. So, the, uh, so this is a little bit of Marx. I don't want to spend too much time with this. So in the first chapter, Marx has this formula. So one is called MCM. And what's, uh, that stands for money, producing commodities. And the purpose of producing commodities is to make a quantity money M prime, where M prime is greater than M. Right? So it's basically making more money. And that he called the circuit of exchange value. And the uh, uh, other circuit is CMC. And what that means is C stands for producing some commodities. Uh, you buy cotton and labor and all of that. And then you take that to the market, and then you sell it for amount of money. But the purpose of that money is not necessarily to make more money, but to be able to buy other commodities so you can live. And, and he called that the use value uh, circuit. So uh, now invoking Derrida, the French philosopher, uh, so the exchange value and use value, these are two parts of a binary, of a, of a dual way of thinking. And the privileged part of the binary is exchange value, and where everything is dominated by exchange value. And that's a topic that we got to unpack and understand. And this subjugation of use value by exchange value, it has happened throughout the history of capitalism, beginning with colonialism and working through international trade and now through globalization. There's a remarkable continuity running through all of that. So to me, let me get back to that, that poverty definition. So, 
so if you can use the concept of use value and exchange value, we can use that to think about poverty. One way to think about poverty is to say people are poor when they don't have access to nutritious food, to a healthy body, to a safe and comfortable home, and I could make that list. So notice I'm saying that they don't have physical access to these things. That's the use value definition of poverty, that they don't have food, they don't have health. The other is to say, well, they don't have these things because they don't have enough money. That's the exchange value view. It turns out that this distinction is absolutely crucial. But the World Bank doesn't talk about it. Economic textbooks don't talk about it. But in my judgment, in my humble judgment, if you don't get this distinction, you don't know jack about poverty. Okay. And, um, now, so, um, and I learned that through Ivan Illich. He didn't use that slang, but uh, um, he's a very gracious man. And uh, so, so he takes a simple example like this. He said, each time you put a car on the streets of Brazil, it is 50 people that are denied good transport by bus. That's interesting. That's interesting. So there's this opportunity cost. And so what we think is basically if you build more superhighways and if you put more cars, that's development and the GDP has gone up. But notice, even as the GDP is going up, it is creating scarcity. Even though the GDP has expanded, it is creating scarcity because many, many people are denied good transport. I just came back from Sri Lanka this summer. And it is absolutely crazy. There are so many cars on the road that this elementary act, the right that people had to use the road to get from one place to another is denied because pedestrians don't count. Right? And, and so, so the cars have basically taken over. So people are proud. They say, well, don't you think this country is developed now? We have so many automobiles. Stupid, you're not. You're not developed because you really denied. You've created scarcity. You created scarcity. How did you create scarcity? For millions of people, you denied their basic right to be able to use the road. And, and, and uh, um, um, Ivan Illich also has this example, what he calls the coca colonization of water. Right? So, that, so that the basic uh, uh, use value that we have for thirst has been taken over by carbonated sugar water. That's not good for you. Yeah. Um, now. So what's wrong with the exchange value view? Now here, I have uh, a fairly long discussion. So I'm going to skip over several slides because this, this is a talk in and of itself. If you're interested in this topic, I've written a paper on that, uh, uh, which I can share with you. It'll be published soon. So let's look at this figure. So on this graph, going from 1900 to 2010, yeah, that's the US GDP. The US is the greatest wealth producing engine ever conceived in human history. We have uh, our, our GDP is around $16 trillion. That's a lot of money. That's, that's about 25% of the world's income, 25% of the world's GDP. It's a lot of money. And yet, when you look at those other figures, you'll see that that has not eradicated poverty. 15% of the people are poor in the US, officially. I know that it's not the same poverty as in Darab, India, but at least the census says that these people are poor. So you've got to just stop and think. If 25% of the world's GDP that we have cannot eradicate poverty, for crying out loud, how much more money would we need to eradicate poverty in Africa? How much more do we need in India if you and they are following the same model in China? So, so that's the dismal picture. This, this should, when I saw this graph, you know, and I told myself, if all of this money can't eradicate GDP, why does brilliant people like Jeffrey Sachs and Bill Gates think that more money is going to eradicate poverty, right? Because they're working within the exchange value framework. Now, um, so in this slide, what I do is to refer to the middle class. If you refer to President Obama's speeches, you see he almost never talks about poverty anymore. He's talking about the contracting middle class 
and how he wants to expand the middle class. So that's, that's the kind of scene, scenario that we want to create. Everybody desires that, right? You want a house with 26 different roof angles and, and, and a white picket fence and a, a BMW. And, and, and everybody, so this is a big business now, you know? This cottage industry, all the books that I've written, you know? Uh, James Carville, I can hear him scream, you know? Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Ariana Huffington on the left, Lou Dobbs, Bill O'Reilly, and there's even a book called Screwed, it's not, it's not about smart, okay? The, uh, the, uh, so, so this is a big cottage industry about helping people to, become, bec to come into the middle class. Now, the, the paper that I wrote is, we cannot all be middle class, it can't be done. Physically, it can't be done. It's very important that we realize it, because it's this 600 pound gorilla that sits in the middle of the room and occupy, sucks up all of the oxygen that we can't think of an alternative way of organizing our lives. You know? And there are very serious economic, cultural, ecological, and structural reasons as to why the middle class in the US cannot be expanded. Uh, and there is no middle class pathway out of poverty for 46 million people in the US uh, that are poor. And the evidence is overwhelming. I've, I've, I've written on this. So, I've, uh, uh, so she just, just one, one figure. What I've done here is taken some census data, and I have uh, uh, arranged it by the number of families that are in various income groups, less than 5,000, 5,000 to 10,000, et cetera. The median income in the US is around $50,000. What that means is half the families earn more than that, and half the families earn less than that. So that black line there is the, uh, uh, the median uh, income. So below that are all the families that are earning less than 50,000, and above that are all of the families earning more than 50,000. So I said, you know, I wish I had, you know, like a golden wand, and I, I'm gonna wave that and say, I wish the, to be a family that earns $50,000. Wouldn't that be nice? Now, so, I was thinking this thought a few Christmases ago. And so then some voice asked me, so how much money do you need for that? Huh? So then I took, went, took my Excel spreadsheets and I calculated that. So if you did that, if all of the households below the median income were to earn 50,000, the economy would have to generate $1.5 trillion each year. It's a lot of money because the total GDP is only about 16, right? Now, so that's a lot of cash. Even if we were to generate all that cash, there's no chance in hell that that's going to go to the poor people. <laughs> Read Piketty and Sais on this, on this. And what, this is a graph from, 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 the, from one of the earlier articles. They've written a very famous book. This is the proportion of income going to the top 10%. And uh, what they say is that the amount of inequality that is there now is the same that as it was in 1929, just before the Great Depression, right? So there's no guarantee that even if you generate all that money, that money is going to eradicate uh, poverty, yeah? Uh, now, in this graph, what I do is the, uh, the labor, US Labor Department has very elaborate calculations on the unemployment rate. And they have really six rates that they calculate. And uh, I'm not gonna go through all of those figures, but the important thing is that uh, are, are these numbers that are down here. So this was 2012 data. The number of unemployed people, uh, unemployed people was 12 million. And the number of part-time workers looking for full-time work was a little over 8 million. And then there's another group called marginally attached. I mean, they're just sort of doing work, but you know, it's, it's, it's not a real job. And they're about 2.4 million. If you add that up, it's 23 million jobs. So now, if you keep saying, I vote for me, I'm gonna solve the unemployment problem, you're basically saying, I'm gonna create that many million jobs each year. Now, what are the chances that we can do this in a global economy? I'm gonna skip through that slide. Uh, and, I, and I really thought about this when I was in, in, in uh, uh, working in, in Philadelphia, the project where I'm doing in West Philadelphia, and, I, and I'm saying, what are the chances that we can create jobs for these people that are going to pay 40, 50,000 dollars when 
kids in Bangladesh are competing for the jobs that they're doing here. It's a global economy. And if you call up the unemployment office in Madison, Wisconsin, you'll hear a voice at the other and say, hello, I'm Kevin, how can I help you? Okay? The call is being answered in Mysore, India. You know? and, and the unemployment office, yeah, you can help me find me a job. You know? Not in Mysore, India, but in Madison. Yeah? And, and, and so, so, so that's a globalized economy. And so I don't know what these folks are smoking. You know, and, and the, the, that, that this idea that we're going to create jobs in this global economy, that uh, uh, that's going to lift people uh, into the middle class. So here, what I have done is a sort of a typical geographer's exercise. You take the jobs in the economy, and you can organize them into different sectors. What's called the primary sector, which is agriculture and mining and then uh, the secondary sector, which is manufacturing. Then there's something called the uh, quaternary sector, which is uh, uh, services, uh, you know, working for McDonald's or, or something a little bit more prestigious. Uh, and then there's something called the tertiary sector, which is the high finance, banking, uh, education, information industry. So let me look at the uh, percent of value added and you can see that this, this red line here, the primary sector, that the contribution of agriculture to the economy, percent-wise, has gone down. We know that. And then the, that green line is manufacturing, and you can see how that has come down. And if you want to go see, that is, that's, that's another whole story about manufacturing going to overseas, to Shenzhen, China, and, and, and uh, et cetera. And, and, and our corporations, corporations like Walmart and Apple, uh, have, been, have been quite complicit in this. Uh, evidently, before Steve Jobs died, he had been at some dinner with President Obama, and President Obama had asked him, you know, could the, the, the campus in Cupertino, California, has about 40,000 jobs, but they've created about half a million jobs worldwide. They've asked him, could you not bring any of those jobs back? And he clearly said, uh, um, those jobs aren't coming back. And uh, so uh, here's the, uh, and you can see that the service sector is pretty still, but I want you to look at the blue line. It's taking off like a, like a jet. That's the financial sector. Those are the geniuses that are making derivatives that make you, you know, and, and, and the housing market, the mortgages and all of that. That sector has really taken off. But that is not the sector that is creating, that sector doesn't create jobs. So you can see that the fastest growing uh, uh, sector of the economy is not creating jobs. So put all of these together, and you have to become very skeptical about how we are going to eradicate poverty by incorporating people into the middle class. And, 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 but that's the whole thesis to think about. But I'm just throwing you a, a few things out there. So that's why I'm very scared. I'm going to skip through this slide also. And there are, this middle class discourse is, a, is a, to me, this idea that I'm going to eradicate poverty by, by bringing you up to the middle class. I know that it's, a, it's, a, it's this, this kind of liberal impulse that we have for equality that is driving that. But my uh, submission to you is that that equality discourse is the basis for creating permanent inequality because we don't have a way of valorizing people and value them other than by saying, well, unless you are living in a suburban home, unless you are driving this kind of a car, unless you're doing this, you are not quite successful. We don't have criteria. We don't have a language to measure the success of people who are just happy, who are life of stress. They are living in healthy bodies. We don't even measure those things. We don't even measure those things. And, and uh, so, the, uh, uh, I want to go to the next slide and I would come back. This is a quotation from uh, uh, the Minnesota uh, uh, state representative, and I'll read it from here. And, and it, this is on a web page. Uh, it says, isn't it ironic that the food stamp program, part of the Department of Agriculture, USDA, is pleased to be distributing the greatest amount of food stamps ever? OK. And then, meanwhile, the National Parks Service, also which is part of USDA, asks us, please do not feed the animals. 
because the animals may grow dependent and not learn to take care of themselves. I mean, read that, read that. I mean, to me, it is dripping with condescension, but worse than that, it is ignorance. It's ignorance. But the point that I really want to make is that that poverty economy that we have created, it insults people. It robs people of their dignity. And, and, and so, so that's, that's another reason why we need to figure out alternative to, um, to the food stamp program to, to, to think, about, think about poverty. So when we think about poverty, we think about it through the equality discourse and expanding uh, benefits and expanding food. I think that we need to start thinking of another logic that goes beyond that, because that logic is patronizing, and, and it robs people of dignity. And that, to me, is almost as serious as, as lack of jobs and all the other reasons that I gave you. Uh, and, the, uh, and then this uh, Paul Ryan, the, the, uh, uh, you know who, who he is. And, and he's now going around the country giving a, a talk on, on, on poverty. And in that, he uses this term, the makers and the takers, right? So to him, makers are the people who are making exchange value. People like uh, Madoff, I suppose, yeah? And, and Wall Street bankers, you know, those are the makers. And then if you are, a, uh, if you are an unemployed steel worker and you're on food stamps, why well, you are a taker, right? And it's that language. That's a language that, that constructs us and describes us in this way. Right? And then there are, I said, there are ecological reasons, and I don't have to do a whole lot more than that, that this large GDP that we're talking about, we are the second largest emitter of carbon dioxide. And um, so, so again, we have to say, how do we improve the quality of life without necessarily involving uh, uh, the generation of carbon? In Pennsylvania, we really, the, you know, when people try to resist this this uh, Marcella shale expansion, people say, "Oh, you're a job killer. You can't talk like that." And 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 so, but at the same time, you can see that that uh, that economy is going to go away in ten years. But in the meantime, they've released all of this carbon. So I think that if you put all of this together, then this kind of concept that we're going to expand the middle class is troubling. How are we doing on time? At four o'clock. Uh, we are fine, huh? Yeah. So uh, I've gone through 90% of the talk. No, I haven't. Uh, so, so here's the summary of that part of the argument. The dominant discourse on poverty is about expanding the middle class. I think we should resist that and offer an alternative vision. Uh, we, since, since we cannot expand the middle class, which is what I, I try to demonstrate, that implies, that implies we don't really have a serious theory for eradicating poverty in America. And, and to me, uh, uh, it's doubly troubling is that not only it's about our own intellectual bankruptcy, but it robs people of their dignity. That's very serious. Uh, and, and, and you saw that quotation from France and, and, and read Paul Ryan. Uh, uh, so to me, it is this very discourse of the middle class, the American dream talk of high-tech, high-wage jobs. You know, Bill Clinton talked about it all the time. The suburban home with a two-car garage. Uh, uh, the uh, equity consumption loans, where the, where the bank would give you a loan just so that you can go out and consume designer clothes, fast food. And uh, uh, it is this model that is perpetuating inequality and perpetuating poverty. And really, there's no way out of it. So this is why we need a new theory of poverty. So uh, um, it just this point, what I'm trying to say is this, that, that, and this is directly addressed to you folks in the university, uh, why economics and geography and sociology, they're deeply implicated in creating this problem. So let me, let me just, uh, uh, so here's the standard map that the geographers uh, draw uh, using the census data. It's the poverty map. So we see where there are the poor people. And, and so what this does, it kind of uh, describes certain places as distressed places. And then other places that have a high per capita income are, are, are places that are, that are good. The, uh, now, this map to me is quite troublesome. And uh, I'll explain that in a minute. 
So here's a map that we draw, say, for Philadelphia. The, the map on the left is the, the poverty map. And you can see that the poverty is mostly in uh, West Philadelphia and North Philadelphia, et cetera. And so uh, and I took this, uh, although one of my students drew this map, I took this out of uh, the Atlas of Pennsylvania. Then they would draw this map of black population. And then they'll notice that there are a lot of black people living in poor areas. And then somehow, meaning from one map creeps into the other. And so there's the poor, there's the black, and then the semiotic uh, uh, leakage is so high that people use the word poor black as one word. You know? Poor blacks, yeah. And uh, so, so that to me is troublesome. So you can see that now there's a layer of race in there, just thoroughly mixed with this. And now it's just more difficult to, and then they'll say, uh, uh, unemployment, and, and again, the, these are the areas where people are unemployed. Now, go on to these areas. It is not their fault that there are no jobs because the jobs have been taken by Walmart and Apple overseas, and I think that you need to bring that in. But nevertheless, we blame the people for being unemployed. And then, then, then we have these female-headed households, it's a big thing, family structure. I mean, you know. I, I look at that map and say, what am I going to do? Marry all these women? You know, <laughs> polygamy. You know? and, and so what is the solution that they, that they give? So this kind of knowledge to me is very destructive. It is destructive for several reasons. That it takes poverty and race and, and uh, culture and puts all of this together. And you can't, it, that's like a walnut. You can't crack that. It's very hard. You know? And the worst thing is that it robs people of agency. Because uh, uh, as a black man or a black woman in West Philadelphia, I have no control over race as to what other people think about my color. I have no control over jobs. I have no control over, over family structures. I mean, who knows why? Uh, uh, you know, I've, I've met young women that said that, so why did you have this child? You don't even have my job. And you yourself as a teenager said, but this is the only thing that loves me. And it's, 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 we, many of us don't have the wherewithal to understand what it is that she's saying. But it's very important to understand that. And uh, so, so you can't ask that person to, to say, well, why are you poor? So this kind of map to me is not very helpful because it, it um, you know, what it is doing, it is creating these rocks of Gibraltar that I can't move. These are these grand meta narratives. It tells me, that it's, it's very simple to understand. You know, I can write a regression equation, poverty is a function of, and put all of these independent variables. You know? and, and, and people are very happy. Uh, we get tenure, we get promoted for writing stuff like that. I think we need to attack this intellect and, and, uh, uh, and, and create a different kind of geography because this is the geography of despair, not a geography of hope. You know? and, uh, so let me move along. OK. Uh, so this is to me is interesting. And, and, I, and I want the academics to kind of listen up a little bit. And don't be mad with me. So in economics, the, particularly in the, in the, in the poverty literature, the organizing concept is economic growth and economic development. What's the distinction? Economic growth is the expansion of GDP, and economic development is creating infrastructure that enables the growth to take place. Yeah? And that's the main way in which they think about poverty. OK. And when you come to geographers, what they do is they map it. They map it. And I show you that map. And, and, and uh, uh, the, uh, what? <laughs> Did I say, that wasn't so funny. <laughs> anyway, that's OK. Yeah. Have two huh? have two OK, so, so, so we have this word called uneven development. That's interesting. The liberals write about it. David Harvey, the famous Marxist geographer, writes about it. Uneven development. I mean, what the hell is even development? Do you want all the counties in the US to look like Orange County, California? Do you want all the places to look like Wall Street? 
So what, what is this uneven development that you talk about? So think of the trap. As soon as you privilege that concept of uneven development, then Athens County or Holland County or any other county, they have to imagine themselves by what they are not. And so what we have here is not valorized because I'm the uneven part of this development. And so, so once you think about it and say, how do smart people do this? And, 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 and so what is this even development? Do you want countries like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and Niger to end up looking like Denmark and, and Europe? You know? So once you start doing that comparison, what it is that those people incorporate that too. So it's a way in which uh, poorer country, or, you know, countries with lower income, they have no criteria to value themselves. I mean, I, I can tell you this beautiful story. This is not, not a slide. I was in Lima, Peru uh, two years ago, and was way up in the Andes uh, where they are growing these, uh, trying to revive the native potatoes. And I, uh, I was in a, in, in a farm, and I met this young man about 20 years. And uh, so uh, I just asked him, I said, how come you're not in Lima, you know, earning money, you know, like uh, being a tour guide and hustling or something like that. Oh, why aren't you doing that? So he, he just looked at me, and I, I don't know what thoughts he had. Here's what he said. He said, you know the meal that you ate today, this amaranth, this chicken, the soup, that we produced all of that on our land, you know. And the water that you drank didn't come from your plastic bottle. It came from, it came from the stream. And then he said, can you see that mountain over there? I said, yes. He said, well, you know you can't see 100 yards in Lima because it has smog all of that. So what he's saying is, look, I have all of these use values. Why the hell do I need to go to Lima, Peru to earn exchange value? Because I, ha I have these things, and I value these things. But you know, it's amazing that he said that but we don't have an academic language to valorize the words of that person because the World Bank negates him. The US census criteria negates him. And if you draw a map, that would be a distressed place, economically distressed place. So we need to put our smarts together and create a different science, a different science of use values, a different geography of use values, different sociology of use values, and figure out if people have health, if people have nutritious food, if people are free of stress, how do you value that? We need, I don't know how many people here do GIS. Get them to do this kind of GIS. That's good mapping too, you know? And distressed places indeed, yeah. Uh, uh. So, so, so I talked about geography. And it's interesting that when it comes to the uneven development, liberals, conservative radicals, they're almost uh, agreed on this. And if you get to sociology, the, 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 you know, we talk about inequality and the organizing principle of inequality is class mobility. And for what is class mobility? It's enabling people who are in, in the lower class to come to the middle class. And I showed you why even in the US it is no longer possible. So think about this, economic growth, uneven development, and class mobility. This is the stuff that we teach young people here. And they take it to the world, and they try to solve the problems of the world with this knowledge. That knowledge is problematic. So we are deeply implicated in creating this problem. Paul Ryan, make us and take us, indeed. Come back to college, we'll teach you something. Okay? And uh, the, uh, so, uh, so to me, the material deprivation that people experience, this generation of psychological stress that people feel. I don't know how many of you have a relative or somebody in your family who's lost a job. You know, it is, it is traumatizing, not just the lack of money, because our self-worth, our ability to support, our love, a lot of that is surrounded with this. And then we make economy, we, we deliberately create stress because we think that it's going to increase productivity. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and then again, the, the other thing that I said is, robbing people of our basic dignity. So it's very important that we understand that the 
exchange value view of poverty that people are poor because they don't have money is something that is propagated by economies through economic growth. It is propagated by geographers by talking about uneven development. And it is propagated by sociologists by talking about class mobility. We got to come up with a different way of thinking about the world. So that's, that's the need for a, uh, so here I put it in uppercase. We need a new theory, yeah? What would it look like? Wait, wait, don't tell me. So we need a new theory. I'm going to talk about that. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about how shall we build that? How shall we build that? One brick at a time, yeah? Uh, so we need a new theory because the existing theories are implicated in creating the very problems that we're designed to solve. And we also need to learn as to where this concept of scarcity comes from. And I'll give you some, that's going to be slightly abstract, but, but we need to figure out what, does it, what, what do we mean by saying that scarcity is socially constructed. That's part of the new theory. And, and here's the real challenge to us. We need to demonstrate that land, land just doesn't mean hectares, by land we mean nature, rainfall, soil, sunshine, all of that. That's, that's the broad definition of land. That land, labor, and capital, that they are not limiting factors of production in improving the quality of our life. That really is the challenge. If we can show that even at very modest levels of capital, we can live better lives. Indeed, there is a science right here in the US right now that shows that. We got to learn that, we got to teach that, we got to popularize that. And, and, and we got to get into the, we, got, we have, to, have to, to get that into the curriculum. So that's, uh, so, uh, uh, so it's about, Basic use values, nutritious food, healthy bodies, safe and comfortable housing, low carbon energy, sustainable transport. And that's the agenda, as far as I'm concerned, for a new curriculum, for a new science. And, and, and what's interesting is that a lot of the science is taking place, but not necessarily in universities. There's a guy called John Jevons, who's in California, who's done this wonderful work on what's called biointensive farming. And he shows you how with very low capital, you can produce very nutritious food. Uh, there's a fellow called Wes Jackson, who's in the Land Institute in, in, in Kansas. He's done this wonderful work. Woods Hole, Massachusetts, uh, Rodale Institute in Emmaus, Pennsylvania. So there's a lot of places where good science is taking place. Um, so invite one of them for the talk next year. Yeah, yeah. You, ha you had a question? Oh, five minutes, damn it, yeah. So, uh, so then, I will have to skip one part, how is scarcity socially constructed? I'm gonna skip that. And how time flies when you're having fun. But let me give you this uh, example of socially constructed scarcity. So, uh, uh, no, I'm not gonna do it there. I'm gonna do it uh, this. Okay, so very roughly, the goods we produce can be divided into two groups. There are basic use values, and then there are high value added goods. To me, poverty exists because uh, the, the direct production of basic use values have been subjugated to the production of high value goods. So to me, instead of defining poverty as not having enough income, poor people not having income, I'm gonna say people are poor when the economy, notice the shift, when the economy doesn't produce enough basic use values at affordable prices. So we had to ask that question. How is it that we have spent $2.7 trillion on health, and yet we can't produce healthy bodies in the country? Okay? Rampant diabetes, rampant uh, heart, heart disease, et cetera. And, and so, so, uh, so I have this concept called ubiety. You buy it is the opposite of something called ubiquity. So to me, the dollar and money, that's a ubiquitous concept. You can take that uh, idea to, to any country in the world. Ubiety is the specificity of place. In other words, if I come to Harlan County or Athens County or come to West Philadelphia, once you know who lives there, once you know what their needs are, then you see resources in a very different way. If you come to Nepal, and I can show you there's a 10-foot waterfall here, that's a resource because it can produce hydroelectricity. 
So resources are not something that is general. There's no such general thing called resources scarce. You got to go to places and see who lives there and what they need before you decide that resources are scarce. And I call that ubiety, uh, uh, specificity of place. So, um, so here's a, a map of poverty. And if you, if you look at these different things, there's Appalachian white poverty. There's black poverty along the Mississippi and, and the co old cotton belt. There's native Indian poverty there's the, uh, along the border. And these poverties are different. They're culturally different. The food preferences are different. The resources are different. So you need to figure out geographers and economic geographers need to go to these places and then, then talk about use values in a different way. You can't just come up with a national solution to poverty because the national solution is expanding GDP. Uh, so what I'm going to show you here is a little bit about uh, food. So uh, there is a theory called biointensive agriculture that John Jevons has, has developed, and we can use that knowledge. And using that knowledge, there is a, a guy, uh, let me pass to the slide and I'll come back to the other. See, here's this fellow. Will Allen, this fellow is a, for, a former a basketball player. He's in Milwaukee, and he has a movement called Growing Power. And if you go look at his farm, it is just a miracle because just in an area that is asphalt, he has you know, beds, uh, raised beds of compost, and he raises Swiss chard and tomatoes and okra. Are you hungry? Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the, the wonderful food that he's raising with very little capital. Where does he get the compost from? From food waste that is given to him by the supermarkets and, and, and uh, 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 grocery stores and wood chips from the city. And then he makes this uh, worm poop. Uh, uh, for, from, for, it's called vermiculture. They call it black gold. And you can actually, he sells them like the same way you buy this coffee from Starbucks. You can go buy a bag of worms you know, and, and raise them yourself. So that's the genius of how he has learned to produce basic use values with very little capital. We should be teaching that. And, and, and so, and then he, he's, he, uh, he's created so many jobs, and uh, particularly young kids who've had a record of incarceration who can't get jobs, he trains them in this. So, so when we think about jobs, you shouldn't be same thing of Microsoft and Nike and, and big companies. There are jobs to be created in simply producing your own basic use values. And that's what Will Allen has demonstrated. Yeah? Uh, uh, if you get a chance, go, go visit his farm uh, and Google him first. Uh, the, uh, so, uh, and then I have a whole set of slides where I take you through Philadelphia demonstrating that land, labor, and capital are not limiting factors to producing food in Philadelphia. That's a case study that I did. But since I'm, I'm supposed to finish, I'm going to just walk to the last slide with a plea to you. The problem of poverty cannot be solved until the university recognizes its own role in perpetuating the problem and help the solution. And that should begin with generating a new science, a science of use values, that helps us to produce food, health, housing, and so on by demonstrating that land, labor, and capital, by looking at land, labor, and capital in new and innovative ways. We need to integrate that knowledge in, 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 in specific places using our tools of spatial analysis, statistics, and cartography, and GIS, and satellite imagery. We need to marshal all those resources to, to demonstrate the ubiety of place, the specificity of place, and to valorize that people who are producing food, and I'm not saying that everybody needs to produce food. You don't need to be self-sufficient. Your community should be producing food through farmer's market, et cetera. That that we need some different criteria on how to valorize those places besides the exchange value criteria of per capita income. And thank you. Yeah. So uh, I'm trying to figure out your use value. 
in a sense that there is an intrinsic uh, value to every place, every person, and the exchange value um, is, is something different from that. I mean, I'm not quite clear as to what you think is, is use value. I mean, it's more like the more pertinent things we value in life. Is that what you're referring to, to use value? Or is it more like every person is as valuable as another person? Uh, I mean, what are you getting at to use value? Well, I can't give you an answer that will exhaust your curiosity on this, because it's a wonderful question. And, and we have only about two minutes, right? Yeah. So, uh, but what I tried to do was to sort of present it by way of example, right? So say, for instance, uh, we, to me, use value is living in a healthy body. Now, if I can, I mean, we'll take the case of diabetes, right? The economy spends $245 billion on diabetes. And billion dollars, that's a lot of money. And I have access to a science that shows that we can control diabetes in this country for a fraction of that money, for a fraction of that money. So I want to invite your attention to that tension, the fact that we do seem to have the knowledge to control this disease through uh, exercise, through eating food, uh, through fitness, and maybe a few supplements, which are usually spices, like cinnamon. And, uh, uh, and, and, and yet, we don't valorize that, whereas we have being drawn into medicalization of the body and pharmaceuticalization of medicine. So I'm saying, let's examine that, because one is the realm of exchange value, which we all caught up in, including the healthcare bill, saying we are suffering because we don't have enough money. It's not true. We're suffering because we don't seem to be using the science that we already have. That, that, is, that is telling me about use value. I know I didn't give you a useful no, answer. I, mean, I, I get it at an intuitive level. I mean, is this as simple as saying that we are valuing the wrong thing? Money yeah. is, I mean, exchange is money based on the idea that money is a surrogate for all those other things you want. Yeah, the, that's an exchange value question because it's worth a million dollars. But uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I shouldn't argue. I've talked to you before. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're here, yeah. So, so two things. You got to talk to your dean, Bob Frank, yeah, and uh, um, the, because he's got this initiative for what he called integrating themes, right? So, so once you get this, once you break yourself out of this fever that is all about money, once you can break out of that, then then you 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 start this conversation, as I said, which should be which should be body centered. To me, body is the is the place to start. It's health. And you, you can't talk about his health without talking about food and fitness, et cetera. That, that uh, you, you, you have to invite the, the, uh, 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 the sociologists and the geographers and the economists and the anthropologists and uh, behavioral sci uh, health scientists to begin to think on these things, that they should read up on them. Some of the literature is there. They can begin to do research. We had to find research money for that. And right now, for community economic development, what we get of a jobs program. We've got to tell them, yes, we need jobs, but we can create jobs while producing these, these use values. So, so you need to talk to influential people. You, 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 the conversation has to start here. Because we are the people who are being paid by the taxpayers to sit on our duff and think about these things. You know? and, and so, so it has to start here. And you're, you're, you're properly placed to do this. You need to start the conversation. Yeah. yeah. Let me let me come over there because yeah. Um, so given your concept of dividing, yeah. um, would you say it's fair to characterize the food theory as um, more like an asset based approach to poverty rather than a needs based approach? You mean like McKnight's work? Yeah. Uh, no, I mean the, the needs are there. You got to you got to think about uh, needs, but but if you, you simply 
yeah, I mean, if you, if you ask people what they need, they would say, well, I need a BMW. Uh, they'll say that. But you'll say, whoa, and you, know, you, you temper that. So uh, you know, for you to drive the BMW, for you to get in and out of there, you need a healthy body, you know? And, and, and you have to start a different conversation. So, uh, so you, you, know, you say, well, all the money in the world is not helpful if you can't walk half a mile or go up the stairs. They put escalators here, right? Take them out, you know? get people to walk. You know? <laughs> And so to me, that is, that is, that is a way in which the, we perpetuate poverty in some ways. Yeah? And uh, so, so landscape architecture, so, so assets meaning, uh, uh, you know, like. Your Nepalese uh, waterfall example. Huh? Your, your, your waterfall example would be a, a natural asset. That's an asset if you have the knowledge to tap that, right? So, 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 so in West Philadelphia, some of the people, you can talk to them about exercise, but you can, we can also, as landscape architects, create an environment that enables walking, that enables climbing stairs. Yeah, we haven't done that in this building. Yeah, and and so 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 uh, uh, so those are assets, but those assets are not necessarily hard assets. It can be our knowledge. Yeah, it can be our values, etc. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. I have exhausted their curiosity. I'm a happy man. <laughs> it's not. That's it. Huh? Okay, it's not. Thanks again, Dr. Yapa. <laughs> <laughs>